In the 80s, Jackson Davies says he became the McDonald's of the acting business in BC. And indeed, he was everywhere, including starring in the hit show Beachcombers as Constable John Constable. That series ran for 16 years, 225 episodes, the longest running Canadian broadcasting television series. As well, Jackson has acted in 160 stage shows all across Canada. He's appeared in more than 300 television shows, and in his spare time, he's written, produced, and directed more than 200 commercials and industrial films. This is one busy, talented guy, Jackson Davies. We've known each other such a long time, 40 years, maybe. Yeah, yeah, we were both in our teens, I believe. Yeah. Or babes, babies. Yeah. Babies, yes. Seven, yeah, I think I was. Yeah. Were you always a performer, even when you were a little guy? You know, I think I was. You know, you kind of look back at it and, and you have your parents or your, uh, you know, your, your relatives that say, yeah, you were always a, a cut up. And, and you know, you, when you look at it, I guess I was, you know, I, I, I was. I found out it, it helped to get a laugh in life. I, uh, I would always take situations and, um, and, and try to find the humor in them. I've heard people in the business say that you have the best comedic timing of anyone. Is that something you can train to, or is that something that just is in you or not? So you see how I paused so it didn't look like I had great sense of timing? Um, you know, I, I, think it's, I think you can't train that. I, I think I'm lucky enough to, uh, um, to have that. Uh, it's, it's a sense of listening, right? And, and, and sometimes it sounds. Uh, and um, you, you, I think either you have it or you, you, you don't. I think either you're funny or you're not funny. We deal with what we have as far as in talent in, you know, in this business. And uh, I wasn't a singer, even though I did musicals. Uh, I, uh, I faked that too. I didn't know I couldn't sing until <laughs> your music director was trying to show me notes to something. I think it was a good man, Charlie Brown or something. God knows why I did that. And uh, they were showing me how to have harmony. And I said, oh, I don't think I do harmony. That, that's too difficult. I just sing whatever. Someone's got a great voice. I'll just kind of sing along with them. So uh, they couldn't fire me at that time, but I was, but I was there. But I was funny in it. I did some pratfalls. Uh, I found also at a very young age, I was kind of awkward and tall and whatever. I think I was like 6'3 when I was like 12. Uh, so I got a lot of response out of physical humor, right? So did you find school easy? No, I, I, I had, and I didn't know it at the time, but I had learning disabilities. I was dyslexic. I had trouble, I couldn't spell. I had trouble pronouncing words. Uh, so either you deal with that one of two ways. I guess either you just kind of go into a shell or you realize if you say something and, and it gets a response, you, you enjoy it. You kind of go. So I kind of used my, I don't, people, I don't know if people thought that I was kind of acting dumb, uh, but uh I thought it was because I got ran over with a car that when I was six, I missed phonics for two weeks. So uh, I think maybe that's why I, I couldn't spell or read. Uh, so I, I, I kind of enjoyed certain things in school. It's really an irony, isn't it, that you say you had trouble reading and speaking some words and that became your business. Like, how do you read scripts? Is uh, that tough? Yeah, it is. It is. And I think I really realized where it really affected me once is we were doing a cold reading of Shakespeare. <laughs> you know, with, and I don't know why, why I'd say, oh, sure, I'll come along. I'll try that. And reading Shakespeare when you're dyslexic and can't pronounce anything, uh, it was. But everyone thought it was the they thought I was joking. They thought that was the most brilliant piece of comedy in the world, how I could find comedy out of a, uh, a play that wasn't supposed to be uh, uh, be funny. But as far as the actual like learning of lines and things, yeah, it, it takes me a lot more work uh, to learn a line. Uh, I, my agent learned early on, and I did too, that uh, there were certain parts I, I wouldn't go out for. Uh, I wouldn't go out for, for doctors. 
And, and, and a number of reasons. One, when they, if they were filming in a hospital, you know they had to do all the scenes that one day because it's very expensive. So if you're playing a doctor and you're in seven scenes, you're going to be working seven. You're going to be working from six o'clock in the morning until two o'clock in the morning. Now, um, so then what would happen is that it's going to have a scene where the doors open and they have the gurney coming in and you as a doctor have to run and see all these important words. And, and I had, it's, for me, it was like learning Czechoslovakian. I, I had no idea what these words were, what they meant, how you pronounce them or whatever, even though they have doctors on set that would tell you. Uh, and I knew that if that would happen, if it was a one shot, which means they'll follow you in, I screw up two lines at the end of this thing, they're going to have to go back and it's going to set up, take them another hour or two to set up. And then, you know, so I learned at that time, not going to do that. Not going to play uh, doctors or anything. I did actually play a coroner once, but it worked okay because I had a mask and I could loop my lines later. Oh, that was a terrible job, putting your hand in bodies. Oh, God. <laughs> Real bodies, of course. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, we are. So you left school early yeah. and you, uh, it's amazing to me, but you joined a theater group that played in playgrounds? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I'm, I actually have to take a look at my life and I'm saying I'm probably one of the luckiest people in the world. Uh, things happen, right? I, I went to a drama school during high school. A great, Alberta government sponsored it. It was fabulous. There was a teacher there who taught something called Playground Players in Edmonton. And then he asked me if I wanted to join this kind of professional company. And I'm going, huh? I went and did this show. And I tell you, and not really, any, all the other actors were, were from university. They were all university trained actors. I had a couple of high classes in high school in this summer class. and. It was the best learning job because if you don't keep kids' attention, they're going to go play on the swings, right? So you had to actually keep them engaged or they would leave. They, they're not polite. They haven't paid their $50 for a ticket, whatever. They will just leave. So we really had to, you had to really work to keep that audience around the pool, right? Uh, and uh, it was fun. It was great. We did. A, I did that for a summer. And then I did a couple of odd other jobs. I, I was a Santa Claus at Bonnie Doon Shopping Center in uh, in Edmonton. The day Santa Claus. In order of importance, it goes day Santa Claus, week night Santa Claus, and weekend. I'm I'm at the lower end. I would spend three hours at the Bonnie Doon Shopping just looking around. A tall, skinny guy with pillows. I was going to say, a lot oh, no. of I mean, padding. I mean, oh my God, yes. Yeah, I think I bought probably up to about 150 pounds at six foot three. The skinniest Santa all, all kind, all times. And I had to boil the Santa. They only had one beard, two and three Santas. And I think the, I think the older Santa did a lot of drinking of rye and smoking x cigarettes. So that was, yeah. so I did odd jobs around, uh, around Edmonton uh, uh, and then was lucky enough to, to join a, uh, the Citadel Theater, uh, which did kind of, they called them, then it'd be called Theater for Young Audiences, with children's theater. It's great, it's great. It's, it's audience participation. You know, you have this little circle, the audience sit there, they'll boo the bad guy, they'll cheer the good guy. It's, it's a really, it's, it's kind of like, old school vaudeville thing. And, uh, and it was great training and I got to do that for three years. Let's talk about the joy of yeah. being an actor. So you've done both film, well, you've done everything, yeah. film, television, theater, commercials, whatever. There's nothing I haven't done, I can tell you right now. <laughs> nothing? The, nothing, I, <laughs> probably nothing. <laughs> and so what do you see as the difference between an act, oh. acting on the stage and acting before a camera. You have an audience, it's immediate feedback, and I'm a little bit of a laugh tart. I, I enjoy that. I, I, I have, for someone whose mind is supposedly a, a little mixed up, I have the idea of listening. I, I have a great listen for the, for the audience. I can tell when a, when a joke is working or not. How much, how, how, how much courage do I have to wait out that laugh? Do I play it? Do I comment on the laugh? All those things you get to do in theater. It's like a bit of a dance. It's comedy, can you can actually choreograph it. It's like a dance, if it does. Now, you, you shouldn't be able to see the wheels turning or the people working you, but uh, that, part is, that part is fabulous. So in front of a camera, do you have to rein it in, your acting, so Yeah, it's yeah. well, so actually, big. a lot of this stuff was pretty big that I used to do, uh, but I used to blame it because the TV screen was very small at that time, right? So the larger TV screen, I'd have probably trouble working now. God knows HD would want to get too close on me. Uh, but yeah, you do. It is a different technique. Uh, the best part of it, I thought I was I thought I was the best actor when I was listening and reacting, meaning watching something happen and then just kind of reacting to it. 
When you're on stage, have you ever had a time when you just forgot the lines? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you saw this. It was called Hockey Mom, Hockey Dad. I tended to do two-handers. For a guy who struggles learning lines, why you do a part with two people, you know, just to show with two people. But it was a hockey show. And, and unfortunately, it was bleachers. So we had to sit in the same place for most of the show. So you have nothing to relate it to. If I was sitting up on the counter during a scene, I'd probably remember my lines a little more sitting up on the counter because you've moved. But you've got two hours of dialogue and you're sitting kind of in the same places. And I remember at once I did a great line reading. I'm thinking, oh, and the audience laughed. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I just killed I've got that. This now. I kill. I'm doing great. And then it got kind of quiet. I went, should I be? And then my mind's going a million miles a second. Should I be talking? Is she talking? If she isn't talking, maybe I should be talking. Do you know where we are? I have no idea. Then I was going to start, uh, start something. That I, oh, I'm going to, oh, God, it's that line. But what happens if I've jumped a scene ahead and deliver the line where all the plot about me be not married anymore is, uh, is the audience doesn't see that and they just think I'm a terrible person hitting on this. All these things are going through my mind in like three seconds. And then I went, well, you know, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and she went, and I said, no, no. She said, oh, and I said, no, really, I, I don't know. I don't know. And she went, ah, and then I kind of, I threw a, a Hail Mary pass. I threw a couple of lines out and it was like, and then she kind of, oh, okay. And then she kind of continued. And I'm going, okay, I kind of back. And so I only cut about a half a page. But for that, for that probably 10 seconds out of my life, it was, it was hell. And then along the way came yeah. Beachcombers. What, a, what an enormous hit. Luck. Remember you said about luck? Yeah. So what was the audition like? Oof. Well, it was only like one line, one or two lines. I think, uh, I think the line was, uh, are you in the rescue business? I'll wait out in the car. That was it. So, I mean, I studied that. I tried to, oh, are you in the rescue business? And I, I tried. You're too much rehearsal. So I went in there. Um, I, I, I did the line, and, and they, they didn't ask me to do it again. I think, oh, either I'm really bad or I'm, or I'm really good. I don't know, right? And they said, so uh, can you go with mustache? I said, yeah, yeah. That, that's part. It was an RCMP officer. I said, oh, yeah, sure. I can grow a mustache. And he said, uh, how tall are you? And I said, oh, 42. And then, oh. And they talked to me. Hired me, I think, God, this is so good. I'm such a good actor. I only have to do it once and they hire me for this thing. Well, RCMP uniforms are really expensive. And they had one uniform, an extra uniform, you know, it was only 42. So the only reason I got the part was I was a 42. And as it was, actually, I'm probably 42 tall, but I didn't want to say that. And if, you, if there's pictures of me for the first year, and I always had my hands folded like this, because I, if I did like this, I'm sure you'd see knuckles and, uh, and, and up, up the wrist. So that was it. That, honest to God, that was it. When you were a little kid, you wanted to be an RCMP officer, and there you became constable. constable. Well, that's in an honorary sergeant in the RCMP, there's only two of us. There we go. I, but they, when they gave me the... When they gave me the, the whole bunch of citations and stuff. They said, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no pension plan for this. You know, this is just a, I, okay, that's fine. I'll take it. So, yeah, so, I, so there I go. I got to be an RCMP officer, even though I couldn't at the time. I mean, I've got a colorblind, dyslexic person being an RCMP officer. Uh, it wouldn't work, right? Yeah. It was uh, the longest running Canadian broadcasting series. When I heard about the show, I actually heard about the show when I was doing driving across Alberta in one of the vans with the acting group, and Bruno was on uh, on the morning show, and they said that he was going to do the show about these uh, beachcomber, this guy, a Greek guy, Greek immigrant, and his indigenous kid are going to go out on the boat and pick up logs. And I remember turning to the other actors and going, are you, "That's the most boring thing. That, that are you kidding? This thing's going to last a week, you know." A year later, I was auditioning for it, and then, then I was with it for 19 years. I, I think it was people embrace small-town Canada. If you take a look at the most successful shows, the Corner Gases, the Schitt's Creek, all these other shows, are small-town Canada. And people can kind of relate to kind of small-town characters. The stories, bizarre, I know this sounds bizarre, but they still stand up. They were about, you know, Indigenous situations. They're about people, you know, stealing First Nations artifacts. They were a, a, about pipelines going to, uh, going from Alberta, going to the coast. They were about uh, salmon enhancement. There were all these things that, that are still happening today. So why hasn't CBC brought it all back? Because you often see American channels, very old series. They're bringing them back and playing them again, a bit of nostalgia. It, uh, 
CBC's got an incredible archives. They've got the whole history of Canadian drama from 1952 to 1992. My concern is not just the beachgoers. My concern is the whole archives of the CBC that no one can access. Every other country in the world can access their, their, their archives. And uh, there's a lot of great stuff. So where are you at, at with Canadian content these days? I mean, public policy seems to jump all over the place. There are regulations all over the place. Do you think it's accomplishing what it's supposed to accomplish? Not that I want to keep beating up on CBC. I've always thought CBC should be Canadian. I mean, 100% Canadian. I think when we have now, we've got a million choices, right? We can go, you know, a million choices, right? Wouldn't it be nice to know that you're going to go to that one channel and it's going to be Canadian? Just one. Just give me one out of the millions. If we don't have content rules, the Americans aren't going to do our shows. Who's going to do it? No one's going to do it. You, you, we will lose our history. We, no one's going to tell our stories. You may get a, you know, a knowledge network or something, but most of the knowledge network shows, which are great, don't, don't tell Canadian stories. Netflix, all the streaming services now, we're up to seven or eight of them, right? And taking millions and millions of dollars out of Canadian pockets every day, uh, they should put into a fund that helps sh maybe fund that one streaming service that's Canadian. You have found another calling that really... Um has become passionate for you, and that's teaching. You Why know, do you love it? Well, I, I, I do love it. And, and you know, I mentioned luck earlier. I'm doing the, a show called The Producers uh, at the Arts Club and rehearsing it at, at uh, Granville Island. You have to go, three hours you're going to park at Granville Island. I had to go move my car, right? Move my car, run into a teacher from Cap University, at that time Cap College in the, in the theater and, and acting department. They said, oh man, we just lost a teacher. We got to, and like next week we're supposed to, and I said, they said, do you want to, have you ever taught? Do you want to teach? I said, oh, I'd love to teach. I, just because I'd say yes to everything. So that's only because I was moving my car at that particular time, I got that job offer. And then I did, was only going to uh, teach for like one term. And then it became two. And then I've been there like 15 years. So now I'm a full, full, uh, full, I'm a, I make the kids call me Professor Davies only once, but they have to do that with a British accent because it sounds a little bit more official when I say British, Professor Davies, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I'm teaching there. I, I, I teach acting, which is great because it's not like I'm teaching biology or something that they have to get the credit for. They want to do this. This is, this is what they've always wanted to do their life and it, they're, all their courses are in, are in theater and acting. I teach mostly in acting for the... Uh, uh, for the screen. Uh, and also I have a business course. Remember I told you how much I love business and I've learned a lot about the business. And uh, so that's enjoyable. And also I teach a project, meaning that I try to empower the, the students to, um, to write their own things. Because uh, if you're just going to wait for that phone to ring, that can be kind of lonely. So you've got to be able to create your own content. And, and I had to do that as an actor. I had to branch into writing. I had to, you know, I adapted a couple stage shows. I thought the best thing for Canadian films, which is a whole different ballgame, is to take a very successful stage show, Canadian show, and then adapt it as a film. I did that twice. One was more successful than the others. But still, I, I think the, uh, there was not a penny made. Uh, and that it's, it's a very strange. TV kind of works. Film, the business model is tricky. Well, the whole life of being an actor and all of the roles that you play that support it. Um, I guess you're a rich man, huh? Yeah, yeah. I think I was rich for like two weeks one time. Uh, you know, I've always, yeah, I was, I would say, someone said, yeah, I said, yeah, I made really good money for an actor, but very bad money for a dentist. Uh, I think the average salary still in Canada is less, or around, will be gentle and say around $20,000 a year. That's what an actor will average their career, over, or rather their, their year, right? Um, it's, and it's actually worse now. There is no middle class actor anymore. I was a middle class actor. I have no problems with that. I, I made, you know, I made good money for Canadian TV. The series certainly helped, but I also did, I did everything I to, to, to do. Not that, the McDonald's of the acting business, I didn't turn down anything. But that can soon end, right? And we're all self-employed. You know, there's no unemployment insurance if you're an actor. So uh, what's happened lately is the 1%, like a lot of things, I guess, are, are doing really, really well. And then then there's kind of the, it's kind of that shrunk. So you're down to like, if, I mean, poverty level is in Vancouver must be like 40 grand a year. That would be a fabulous year for an actor. 
right, in, in Vancouver. An actor, make an act, Canadian actor, and Vancouver normal actor, other than the stunt people who will make a bit more. So we've lost that whole thing. We've lost that middle class actor. And the thing that even bothers me as much is, is where they, we're going to lose them from Vancouver. You can't afford to live in Vancouver. So where do you lose, where do your actors go, right? They can't afford them. Maybe they'll go, maybe move to Powell River or other places. You can do a lot of auditioning now on tape. Uh, and then you start to lose theater actors. You lose your creative community because you can't afford to live. I mean, Vancouver's a world-class city. I know that. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Um, you were so kind to help me out to, to help raise money for uh, uh, subsidized housing for people in the arts, right? It's called Pell. And, and the idea was that when people get 55 or 60 years old, they're not working anymore. You can't, we didn't have much of a pension plan. And uh, so you're not, you're struggling to live in Vancouver. Uh, you know, with, again, with your help and others, we were able to, to build a, a, a performance artist lodge, basically subsidized housing. And we've got a new one coming online. I'm on the board of that as well. Um, you find out as an actor, you, you, you when you're that middle class actor, it's not like you can be a philanthropist. You can't really spit. You can't give money to things. What you have to do is you you have to try to help raise money for, for things. So, uh, and the arts is a tough is a tough thing. There's so many important charities out there. You know, Children's Hospital. We went through that with our with our grandchildren. But what wonderful things that you people want to donate money. But sometimes arts kind of falls down the level. You know, it seems like our whole community, even the film industry, it's always. It's always subsidized. You have your hands out all the all the times uh, to to get it done, and uh, I guess that's the the problem with the success and beauty and wonderful things about Vancouver is we may find that that the artists and not just the actors. I'm thinking about the painters and everything else. Everyone in the arts won't be able to afford to live here anymore, and that will you know I I think that kind of hurts the soul of a city. So it's not been the easiest life. It's had lots of joys and ups and downs. Would you, looking back, do anything differently? Hmm. Yeah, I never, I never went to the states. When you're, it's another thing if you're an actor. When you get get recognized and people think you're good, the first thing they say is, "When you're leaving, is there any other profession when you're asked to leave the country when you succeed?" Uh, I didn't. I was working a lot, and uh, and I had mentors like Bruno and Robert, who who were that generation that stayed here. Bruno's, you know, all his buddies, the, the Shatners of the world and everyone else, they moved down to the States. Bruno stayed here to, to make a living in Canada. Did it cost us money? Yeah, yeah, it did. You don't make as much money here. You make a fraction that you make in the States. If I did the same amount of work, if I had done the same amount of work in the States, I, I wouldn't have to work a minute in my life. As it is, I've got to work the same, no. <laughs> but uh, what I've done differently, it sounds tacky, but I may have taken advantage when I was doing a lot of American TV shows here of going down to the States and, and, and then that would raise my value in Canada. Yeah. Well, thank you for being a Canadian actor in our own country. You've contributed so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Jackson Davies, a true BC legend.